we begin to see a glimmer of the realization of that hope as Mary is told what is about to happen. Now in the sixth month, God sent an angel, Gabriel to Nazareth, Gabriel to Nazareth, a village in Galilee, to a virgin named Mary. She was pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of King David. Gabriel appeared to her and said, Greetings, you who are highly favored, the Lord is with you. Mary was confused and troubled by his words and wondered what the angel's greeting could mean. But the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you are to name him Jesus. He will be very great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his ancestor David, and he will reign over Israel forever. His kingdom will never end. Mary asked the angel, How can this happen, since I am a virgin? The angel answered, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the baby to be born will be holy, and he will be called the Son of God. What's more, even your relative Elizabeth is going to have a child in her old age, and she, who was said to be unable to conceive, is now in her sixth month. For nothing will be impossible with God. I am the Lord's servant, Mary answered. May your word to me be fulfilled. Then the angel left her.
Isaiah speaks of God's command to speak tenderly to Jerusalem. And so here we see the theme of love, which is also a part of Advent. And back in Luke's account, we find the fulfillment of this prophecy as Zechariah receives an angelic message. While Zechariah was in the sanctuary, an angel of the Lord appeared to him, standing to the right of the altar of incense. When Zechariah saw him, he was startled and overwhelmed with fear. But the angel said to him, Do not be afraid, Zechariah. God has heard your prayer. Your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you are to give him the name John. He will be a joy and delight to you, and many will rejoice because of his birth. For he will be great in the eyes of the Lord. He must never drink wine or other fermented drinks, and he will be filled with the Holy Spirit, even before he is born. And he will turn many of the people of Israel back to the Lord their God. He will go as a forerunner before the Lord in the spirit and power of Elijah, to turn the hearts of the fathers to their children, and the disobedient to the wisdom of the righteous, to prepare the people for the coming of the Lord. John was the forerunner, preparing the people of God to receive their Messiah. Advent is a time to remember that we are also called to search our hearts and prepare ourselves to receive Christ anew. Tonight, let us renew our commitment to make room for Christ in our hearts, in our families, in our church, and in our daily lives. Give us clean hands. 
probably expected a grand entrance by this king of kings with fanfare and an announcement to the entire world. But God's ways are often so different from ours. He had a very different plan. But you, O Bethlehem Ephrathah, are only a small village among all the people of Judah. Yet out of you will come for me one who will be ruler over Israel. His origins are from long ago, from the days of eternity. In those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census could be taken of the entire Roman Empire, <coughs> and everyone went to their own ancestral towns to register. And because Joseph belonged to the house and line of King David, he went up from the village of Nazareth in Galilee to Bethlehem in Judea, David's ancient home. He took with him Mary, who was engaged to him, and was expecting a child. And while they were there, the time came for her baby to be born, and she gave birth to her firstborn, a son. She wrapped him snugly in stripes of cloth and laid him in a manger, because there was no guest room available for them. Luke 2, 1 through 7. The long-awaited day had arrived. 400 years of silence were broken by the sound of a baby's cry in a manger outside of a small town in Judea. The Son of God, whose origins are from eternity past, who is the very radiance of God's glory, and through whom the entire universe was created, was now born in the most humble of circumstances.
seen a great light. On those living in the land of deep darkness, a light has dawned. For to us a child is born, to us the son is given. The government will rest on his shoulders, and his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. The greatness of his government and peace will never end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness. From that time on and forevermore, the zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. Isaiah's pronouncement is made a reality that starlit night in Bethlehem, and heaven could not contain the excitement. Luke's account continues with the angel's proclamation to the shepherds. That night, there were shepherds living in the fields nearby, keeping their watch over their flocks at night. Suddenly, an angel of the Lord appeared among them, and the glory of the Lord surrounded them, and they were terrified. But the angel reassured them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will bring great joy to all the people. Today, in the city of David, a Savior has been born. Today, in the city of David, a Savior has been born. He is the Messiah, the Lord. And you will recognize him by this sign. You will find a baby wrapped snugly in strips of cloth and lying in a manger. Suddenly, the angel was joined by a great multitude of others, the armies of heaven praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven, and on earth peace to those with whom he is pleased. When the angels had left them and returned to heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. So they hurried to the village and found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in the manger. Good news of great joy. Heaven and earth rejoiced in the birth of the Savior. The angels sang and the shepherds were filled with excitement. The joy of Advent is the realization of the promise of God fulfilled that night and in us today. Christ is born.
being with us tonight and sharing this Christmas Eve service and uh, you have spoken and we try to listen to that you ask for this. I want to uh, invite you to, if you brought your Bibles, maybe you will remember this passage. It's in John's Gospel, chapter 1. And it's the very first part of that chapter 1, beginning of verse 1, down through verse 14. But before we read that scripture, there's a reading by J.D. Phillips called The Visited Planet. It's about a junior angel who is being given a tour of the universe by a senior angel. And after touring of the galaxies of the universe, they come at last to our solar system. And the junior angel is tired and bored and not very impressed by what he sees. And the senior angel points to Earth and says, keep an eye on that planet. Well, the younger angel thinks that the Earth looks small and dirty and very insignificant. That, says the senior angel, is the visited planet. The visited planet. You don't mean, the junior angel begins to interdict. Yes, said the senior angel. That planet has been visited by our angel, the Prince of Glory. Do you mean to tell me that he stoops so low as to become one of those creeping, crawling creatures of that floating ball? Asked the junior angel. I do, said the senior angel. And I don't think he would like you to call them creeping, crawling creatures in that tone of voice. For strange as it may seem to us, he loves them. <laughs> he went down to visit them, to lift them up, to become like him. The junior angel was bewildered and had no reply. The very thought is beyond his comprehension. Well, it's beyond our comprehension as well, isn't it? And yet, we read in this prologue to John's Gospel these incredible words. If you have your Bible and you want to follow along. John chapter 1, verse 1. In the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God. And the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through Him all things were made. Without Him nothing was made that has been made. In Him was life. And that life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness. And the darkness does not overcome it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. And he came as a witness to testify concerning that light, so that through him all might believe. He himself was not the light. He came only as a witness to the light. The true light that gives light to everyone was coming into the world. He was in the world and through the world. And though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. He came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. And yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Children, born not of natural descent, nor of human decision, or a husband's will, but born of God. The Word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen His glory, the glory of the one and only Son who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. What an incredible statement by John the Revelator. What an incredible statement. The Word became flesh and made His dwelling among us. We have a word for it, actually. <coughs> Maybe you know the word. The word is incarnation. <coughs> incarnation is the word. The word took on human flesh. The very word of God. 
born in a manger in Bethlehem, would, would grow into a man who would reveal in himself the very character of God. The very thought is beyond our comprehension. What great, what great news, what good news that is for us. For us to know tonight that we are not alone in this world. Amen. We're not alone in this world. We don't live in a cold, impersonal universe, although it may seem like it a lot of times, that God has been and is among us. God understands our situations. We live in a God-visited planet. Hallelujah. Thank His name for that. Wow. I was reading recently about a stand-up comedian named Greg Dean. And early in his career, Dean made very little money and consequently had no money to buy Christmas presents. So he came up with a unique idea. He developed a comedy routine and then he went to the homes and the houses of his friends and his relatives where he gave this routine and made that his Christmas present to them. <laughs> don't, don't you think that Greg Dean's friends treasured that gift more than anything he could have purchased for them? He came to them individually and he gave of himself to them for their gift. Wow. That's exactly what God did. It's exactly what God did. He came to us and gave of himself. You and I have been through another hectic Christmas season. And now it's time to stop for a few minutes here on Christmas Eve and reflect on the meaning of it all. Dr. Pablo Diaz tells a story that, that kind of captures what can happen to us during the Christmas season. <clears throat> Typical of last minute Christmas shoppers. A mother was running furiously from store to store. Suddenly she came, became aware that the pudgy little hand of her three-year-old son was no longer attached to hers. So in a panic, she retraced her steps and she found him standing with his little nose pressed flatly against a frosty window. You want to know what he was looking at? He was gazing very intently at a manger scene. Hearing his mother's near hysterical call, he turned and shouted with such innocent glee, Look, Mommy, it's Jesus! Baby Jesus in the manger! With obvious indifference to his joy and wonder, this mother impatiently jerked him away, saying, We don't have time for that! Well, on this day today, you and I have chosen to take time to rediscover the meaning of Jesus' coming to earth. And we look beyond the shepherds and the stable and the angels and the magi and even Mary and Joseph and focus like that little boy on the baby Jesus. What does it mean to us that God has become one of us? What does that mean? What does it mean that the Word became flesh and dwelt among us? Well, John tells us a couple of things that it means. First of all, it means that light has come into a world of darkness. That's what it means. Because he writes here in John 1 verse 5, he said, The light shines in the darkness and the darkness has not overcome it. Now we all know, we all know what it's like to stumble in the dark, right, without the benefit of light. In fact, our toes tell us that, right? You probably have scars you can show me. We won't take the time to do that right now. But I, I know at least a couple of you posted something on Facebook here recently about the, having that unfortunate opportunity to do that. But there's so little that any of us really understand about life that apart from Christ, this is a very dark world. 
Thank God that in this dark world, a light shines. Thank God. But it's, it's not more knowledge that the world needs. It's not more knowledge. We have enough knowledge. It's not tinsel or gifts or parties or even carols that mean Christmas. It's a person. A light shines in the darkness. The Word becomes flesh. A babe born in Bethlehem. He is our light. He is our hope. He is our peace. That's what John is getting at. And that's the first thing that John tells us about the meaning of Christmas. That the light has come into a world of darkness. Praise His name. The second thing he tells us is why Christ came. He came that we might become children of God. He came that we might become children of God. So often, we miss the real meaning of Christ's coming. We say that Christ came to die for the sins of the world. Well, He did. He did die. And by His death, we do find salvation. Amen? Thank God for that. But according to John, that wasn't why He came. He came so that we might become new creations. As John writes here in verse 12 of, first, of this first chapter, to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. That's wonderful news this, morning, this evening. Thank God. Or as J.B. Phillips put it in that visited planet that I told you earlier, he said the Prince of Glory went down to visit them, to lift them up, to become like him. That's why he came. Imagine that. You and I, children of God. Can you imagine? <laughs> that is, Christmas is ultimately about transformation. That's what, why we celebrate Christmas. Now, maybe you know the story of Lee Strobel. Lee Strobel was a hard-nosed investigative journalist for the Chicago Tribune. He was an avowed atheist. His editors gave him an assignment. He was to report on the struggles of an impoverished inner city family during the weeks leading up to Christmas. Well, that assignment happened to send him to the Delgado family. Sixty years old, Perfecta Delgado and her granddaughters, Lydia and Jenny, had been burned out of their roach-infested tenement where they were now living in a tiny two-room apartment. And Lee Strobel couldn't believe how they were living. No furniture, no rugs, nothing on the walls, only a small kitchen table and one handful of rice. Their situation was so dire that 11-year-old Lydia and 13-year-old Jenny owned only one short sleeve dress each plus one thin gray sweater that they shared between the two of them. In fact, they said when they walked the half mile to school through the body cold, Lydia would wear the sweater for part of the distance and then hand it to her shivering sister who would wear it the rest of the way and do the same back home. But despite their poverty, this impoverished grandmother and her granddaughter still had their faith in Jesus. He had not forgotten them, and that brought them immense joy that couldn't be explained. Lee Strobel completed his article and moved on to another assignment, but as Christmas approached, he thought of that family with, with so much joy, but, but not much else, he remembered. And so he wrestled with the irony of the situation. Here was a family that had nothing but faith, and yet they seemed happy. <laughs> While he had everything he needed materially, but lacked faith. And inside he felt just as empty and barren as the Delgado's apartment. Strobel visited the family again closer to Christmas, and he was amazed at what he saw. His readers of the Chicago Tribune had responded overwhelmingly to the Delgado family's needs with furniture, new furniture, appliances, rugs, a Christmas tree, stacks of wrapped presents, food, and plenty of warm clothing for the girls. Also donated was an, a 
abundance of cash. But the biggest surprise of all, said Lee Strobel, one that knocked, his, knocked him off his feet, was that the grandmother and the granddaughters were now busy preparing gifts themselves. They were giving away what had been given to them. Our neighbors are still in need, she said, the grandma said. We, we cannot have plenty while they have nothing. This is what Jesus would want us to do. So she, she waited all these gifts. This is wonderful. This is very good, she said. We did nothing to deserve this. It's a gift from God. But it's not his greatest gift, she said. Her words were cutting to the heart of Lee Strobel, this reporter who claimed there was no God. No, she said, we celebrate that gift tomorrow. That is Jesus. And Lee Strobel knew the Delgado family had something he didn't. And as he left that tiny apartment, he longed to know the Jesus that they knew. And eventually he did. Lee Strobel came to know Jesus. My friends, that's why Christ he came to bring light into a dark world. To make it possible for every person on earth to know that they are children of God. He came so every person on earth might have the same kind of transformation that Lee Strobel had. How about you? The Prince of Glory came down to visit us. To lift us us up to become like him. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. That's why we celebrate tonight. And in doing that, we, we share our thanks by partaking in communion. And tonight we're going to do it a little differently <coughs> for those who are used to our normal way of doing communion. We're going to do it by what we call way of intention. We will ask you to, uh, in a moment, we will ask each aisle to come step out to this aisle and to this aisle and come down here and receive. We'll have our staff here. If they will come now, it would be nice. Uh, Pastor Barb and Michael on this side, and Pastor Candy and I on this side. And as you come forward and you will receive the, uh, the bread and you will break a piece off of the bread and then there will be a, the grease be a cup that you will dip that into. And then as you walk past, after you take your communion, you see a candle on, in these baskets on the table. If you'll take one of those candles with you, because here in a little bit we're going to be sharing the light from the Christ candle with each other, and we will end our service that way. So as you uh, come to the center aisle and take your bread and dip it in the, in the juice, and then pick up a candle and go back around on the outside aisles to your seat. <clears throat> Congregation of Jesus Christ, the Lord has prepared his table for all who love him and trust in him. Those who trust in him alone for their salvation, all who are truly sorry for their sins and who sincerely believe in the Lord Jesus Christ as their Savior, and those who desire have a desire to live pleasing and in obedience to Him as Lord, are now invited to come with gladness to the table of the Lord. The gifts of God are for the people of God. The bread that we break is a sharing in the body of Christ. We who are many are one body, for we all share the same loaf. And the cup, the cup for which we give thanks is a sharing in the blood of Christ shed for us. The cup that we drink is our participation in the blood of Christ. Now let's pray together a blessing over these elements. Father God, God in Christ breaks down the walls.
that make us strangers to ourselves and divide us from one another. Tonight, reminded of why you came, Lord, we are the body of Christ. And around this table, we enact our faith. The body broken is restored to wholeness. Lifeblood poured out brings healing to our world. So as we participate in the death and burial and resurrection of our Lord through sharing in communion, may we be reminded of your gift to us with thankful hearts. We pray in Jesus' name. So if you will just start from the from the front, uh, if you will start from the front row and just come to the center aisle, and then just just kind of file out and then back on the on the back side and on this aisle. Then we'll...
Christmas. After seeing the baby, the shepherds spread the word about what had happened and what the angel had told them about this child. All who had heard the shepherd's story were amazed, but Mary treasured up all these things and pondered them in her heart. The shepherds went back to their flocks, glorifying and praising God for all the things they had heard and seen, which were just as the angel had told them. The shepherds could not help but spread the good news of Christ's birth. They had received a special blessing by being some of the first to see the Son of God born in flesh. Tonight, we have received the blessing of Christ as we shared in communion, once again receiving him into our lives. Now, as we pass the light of Christ to one another, let us be reminded of the shepherd's joy. Christ's birth in us moves us to share this good news with others. Oh. 
Thank the Lord for the life that has come to make our world bright. Bright with the good news of His Son. The good news that you and I are brothers and sisters. We are children of God. Amen. Amen. <laughs> now would you stand please and receive the benediction. Brothers and sisters, as we go from this place, remembering whose night this is, may you go with the joy and the life that he gives. And may his peace truly reign in your hearts and in your lives. Go in the peace of the Lord be with you. Thank you. God bless you.